good. So, um, I want you to always remember as we're studying the New Testament and as we're studying our um, uh, the Jews, Israel, in the New Testament, it's so important that you remember how God created the ethnics and what he did. Remember this. Always keep this in mind, even when you're home reading. And by the way, if you can try to blow through this week and read the book of Matthew, actually, I think you got two weeks to do it. You should really try to do it after I've taught it tonight, mm -hmm. because some things will really pop as you read that, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and, and just kind of eat scripture. In other words, don't necessarily think, well, I need to just ponder and meditate. I'm not saying don't ponder and meditate the word. There's a time and a place for that, and we should do that every day. But if you also can, eat scripture up and just, just be digesting it and try to take it in. So as you're constantly reading scripture, I want you to always think first and foremost, am I in the Old Testament or am I in the New Testament? Because one of the biggest problems, both with being either too pro-Israel or to anti-Israel, whatever we tend to, to go towards more, there's one reason for that, for both those problems, and it's covenantal confusion. And so in this whole series, we're really going to try to clear up covenantal confusion. And that's the first thing you do when you open your word and you're reading. Remember where you're reading. If you're reading out of Old Testament, which you should be doing, remember, it's the Old Covenant. We're not under that anymore. So what it speaks to, we've got to, it's going to have to go through a certain amount of filtering. Or you're reading under the New Testament, which is, that's what we're living under, the law of Christ and so forth. And so if it's, you know, talking about the Old Testament and the New Testament, we're going to learn how to filter that correctly. But the other thing I want you to always remember when studying the word, when reading the word, when going over these notes is that remember, God first, when he made man, he made all men Gentile. He chose out of the Gentiles. He, he, he ultimately ended up dividing them. They multiplied like crazy, right? And then he divided them where? At the Tower of Babel, only into different groups by language, right? And that's what we say now makes up the different ethnics. But really, at that point in time, even if he divided them at the Tower of Babel, everyone was still a Gentile, is all it was. And then out of the nations that came out of this, so I'll use the word nations, not even ethnic, the nations that ended up coming out of God dividing, okay, out of the nations came a brand new ethnic, and that was the Jews. And we know the father of that was Abraham, right? And they are still with us today. And eventually, it was Israel that came out of that because it was passed on to Isaac and then to Jacob. And Jacob had a name change, and he became Israel. Okay? And then, of course, we know that from him came the 12 tribes and then came the nation, right? And it's still with us today. They are a distinct ethnic that God made. Okay, they never totally blended into the Gentiles. And you look at all those other ancient nations, they're gone or they're blended in or or they've they've you know um they've um uh, they've either you know are no longer around, but really I think more accurately could be said is that they've merged into who we are today. But the <coughs> Jews are still distinct, distinct, distinct. They are Jews. Now, right now I am talking about the bloodline, the DNA, the natural, right? So we have natural man Gentiles, we have natural man Jews, and then of course, the big thing came in history that divided both time and space was Jesus Christ, and under the new covenant comes one new man, a brand new ethnic. So all I'm saying is, as you're studying the word of God, always remember, even though you're going to see Jew and Gentile being written in your New Testament as you're reading, you still got to categorize as to whether we're talking about the church, one new ethnic, or Jews or Gentiles, okay? And, and that will help you as you're, as you're, as we're fixing some of our thinking in all of this stuff, okay? That will just help. All right, any questions on that so far? Okay, good. That's just a quick review to get you warmed up. Now, let's talk about Israel in the New Testament. Tonight, we're going to cover the um, Gospel of Matthew. And as I said earlier, we're all very much aware of the heresy called replacement theology regarding Israel and the church. With this conviction, 
the church has replaced Israel in the plans and purposes of God. Um, now, you would think that one would see fading significance of Israel. You would think that you would just see a total fading of their significance in the New Testament if replacement theology was correct, mm -hmm. right? Which just is another proof that it's not correct. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the name Israel is mentioned over 70 times and always with the ethnic meaning of the Jewish people, meaning the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Furthermore, there's much as much about Israel's future as her past, especially in the last book of Revelation, in terms of the whole New Testament. So, um, the fact scripturally is that Israel and the church have, in this age that we're living in, after the cross, a parallel existence. We're existing together. Um, until the day that these two groups, one new man and the Jews, fully merge as one flock under one shepherd, ultimately completing the creation, completing the creation of that one new man. And it will be under the shepherd of Yeshua HaMashiach. In other words, what I'm saying is right now, this one new man is growing and he is becoming, but... One day, he's going to merge with the Jews, or Israel, and he's going to be complete. Right now, they're parallel together, not, they're parallel alongside each other, but not together yet. Okay, in part, are they? Yeah, sure, there's some, but not fully yet, as to what God wants, okay? All right, now, at, like I said, as of right now, that merging is in part, because there are some Jews who believe in Yeshua. So, Lord willing, we're going to look at five books in the New Testament, Matthew, Acts, Romans, Hebrews, and Revelation, because it is not only our mandate to be a channel of salvation to the lost, but it has also been given to us, one new man, because that's who we are, one new man, it has been given to us the priority mission to the Jew first. We talked about that last week, right? That's the number one priority is Jew first and then the Gentile. And in order to do that as Gentiles in this classroom, we need to understand the Jew who's very different from the Gentile and has been dealt with differently by God. So we begin with Matthew. This book was written by a Jew and was directed primarily to the Jews, or at least predominantly to the Jews. Not that the, it can't be a book for the Gentiles, it is, but it was primarily for the Jews. Why? To help solidify that observation, I'm going to give you seven quick reasons as to why this book, Matthew, was primarily for the Jews. Number one, Matthew opens with the genealogy of Jesus. Brand, you get right to the beginning of Matthew, and there's a genealogy right there. If you're writing for Gentiles and wanted to capture their attention, you would not begin with a genealogy. <coughs> but if you go to the beginning of Matthew, it reads like an old-fashioned telephone book. The Gospel of Luke was written for Gentiles primarily, and Luke also includes the genealogy of Jesus, but not at the beginning. Luke grabs your interest before he goes into the genealogy. So what's the difference? For a Jew, the family tree is vitally important. Mm -hmm, yeah. Don't even talk to me about anything until you first <clears throat> give proof. And it's interesting, by the way. And that's why he put it first. So that's the first reason. Okay, the second reason we believe this gospel was primarily written for Jews is all of the information included in it from the Old Testament. It has far more history than the Gospels of Mark and Luke and John. Matthew is just filled with Old Testament. Matthew just picks up strand after strand of Hebrew scripture, and it's significant that so much Old Testament scripture is rewritten in the very first book of the New Testament. But another interesting thing is that Matthew seems to have a favorite word in this book, fulfilled fulfilled. When you're reading through it in the next two weeks, notice the word fulfilled. What does really fulfill mean? Well, it just simply means to get it done. Fulfilled, to get it done. Or to turn words into deeds. I like that one. To take words and transfer them to action. 
or to bring about the reality of something. So here's, for instance, a phrase out of the book of Matthew, that it might be fulfilled that was written in the prophets, that it might have gotten done. You see that? So Matthew points the reader to the life of Jesus as the fulfillment of what the prophets foretold. He tells the Jews, Matthew does, that Jesus took the words of the law and the prophets in the Old Testament and he turned them into action. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In other words, every Old, T Old Testament prediction became reality through Jesus. The Jews needed to hear that. Yeah. Because they know Old Testament. A Gentile who comes to know Jesus, right. they don't know Old Testament. They're not really steeped in it, but a Jew would be. All right. Number three reason is the third commandment. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Okay? The Jews have a fear of using the name of the Lord in vain. Even today, when reading articles written from Israel, for instance, in the Jerusalem Post, and I follow the Jerusalem Post on my Instagram and I read articles from them, they will write like this. If they have an article where they use the word God, it will look like this. G dash D. They will not write the whole name God. They never want to say that for fear that they might use it wrongly. So what do they do? Well, they when they're talking, they use a euphemism or writing. They use a euphemism instead of saying God. And one of the euphemisms used to replace the name God is heaven. Pray to heaven. Heaven will help you. And when you read throughout Matthew's gospel, you do not really find the phrase kingdom of God. It's, there's a, a couple places where you'll see it, but what you will find is kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven. But Ma uh, Mark, Luke, and John, it's always kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of God, but not in Matthew. Because Matthew has Jewish readers in mind, so he takes great care when he talks about the kingdom of God to say the kingdom of heaven which has become a synonym for God. So that was the third reason. Okay, the fourth reason that we notice about this gospel is Matthew, who was a collector of people's taxes, he was a tax collector, he's become a collector of Jesus' teachings. And you know what? He has grouped Jesus' teachings into five groups. Five great sermons in the gospel of Matthew about the kingdom of heaven. The first one, Sermon on the Mount. That's the lifestyle of the kingdom and how we're to live. What about the second one? The mission of the kingdom of heaven, how we're to live. The third, the growth of the kingdom of heaven, from a tiny mustard seed to a great grand tree that birds can make nests in. Um, and then fourth, the community of the kingdom of heaven, how believers are to live with each other within that kingdom. And then the, finally, the fifth one, the future of the kingdom of heaven. What's going to happen at the end of this age? And it's interesting that he has grouped Jesus' teachings into five sections. Do you know what I think? I think he might have been reflecting the Torah, mm -hmm. the first five books of the Bible, because he's a Jew who's thinking in terms of the Bible. And in the first sermon and the last sermon of these five, Jesus preached up on a mountain. Sermon on the Mount, and the last one was on the Mount of Olives. Okay, and isn't it interesting that Moses went up to Mount Sinai to receive the revelation from God? So there seems to be an echo in all of this. You can just really see the Jewishness and the heritage of the Jewish um, history. Okay, the fifth reason why we believe that this is really um, primarily a gospel directed towards the Jews, okay? Matthew mentions the name Israel 12 times, and that's way more than any other gospel mentions Israel. And he's talking about that particular ethnic of people, the Jews in Israel, okay? The sixth one, okay? The old hot topic. It's all about marriage and divorce. The gospel of Mark and Luke were written much more primarily for Gentiles. Okay, Luke was a Gentile, Dr. Luke. He got all his information from Jews, but he definitely wrote for the Gentiles. And Mark was writing about all of the action 
It was more about what Jesus did so that we understand, people of the world understand what Jesus did. Matthew was more about what he said. Mark was more about what he did. Luke, of course, you know, he was uh, for the Gentiles. And, and, uh, and then John was for mature believers. So why do I bring this up about marriage and divorce? Well, in both the Gospel of Mark and Luke, both of those is given an absolute 100% prohibition by Jesus on divorce and remarriage. It's a categorical statement, period. And they both quote Jesus saying that if anyone divorces his wife and marries another, he is committing adultery, period. It's categorical. And then he goes on in those two books and says, and if anyone marries someone who has been divorced, they're committing adultery. They're breaking that commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. No exceptions. It's categorical. But then all of a sudden, when you come to Matthew, there's one exception to that rule, which is a surprise. Now, why is the exception for divorce made only in the Gospel of Matthew. Why is that exception not listed in Mark and Luke as well? It's, a, it's, it's absolutely a seeming contradiction, but it's not. Here's the answer. Jesus was addressing Jews in Matthew whose culture and law was different than Gentiles regarding marriage. This for the Jews would be significant as they knew their laws were different than the Gentiles. Now, the church has fallen far, far, far throughout the world in the whole marriage and divorce situation. We even have pastors now who are divorced in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. Departure from truth results in a loss, loss of, of power. power. That's right. That's right. And that's the thing. So, fixing this situation, especially when you've got a marriage, divorce, and a remarriage, and then a new child that has been made from the union, uh, the new union, it's a mess. It's a mess. How do you repent from that? Because living, continuing living in it is continued adultery. It's, it's, it's a mess. It really is a, a, a huge mess. So, again, I'm the messenger. I did not write the Word of God. I am just telling you what it says. And I'm telling you that part of the reasons that we have failed as a church is due to this. We are no longer under and living under the law of Moses. We do live under the law of Christ. And every situation under the law of Christ exceeds the law of Moses. Do you know what I'm talking about? So that's the other big situation. So if you're ever wondering about why marriage and divorce and that is treated differently, that's the reason. Any questions on that at all? Can you explain how it is treated differently? What it says that's different? Okay. Well, it start. Okay, yes, I can. The Jews, how did they look at marriage differently than the Gentiles? Okay. Now, for modern day, it's not like this, unfortunately, anymore. But, of course, this was 2,000 years ago. When Jews were engaged, they called it betrothal. It's a much more serious state um, of a relationship than is what we call engagement, even though they say that they're the same, betrothal and engagement, but it's not, okay? Betrothal in the Jewish culture was a formal ceremony in which a couple became married in every single aspect except physical consummation. The woman took on the man's name. In fact, if that, and, and they were considered a wife and a husband too, even though they had not physically um, consummated. <clears throat> and if that husband during the betrothal period died, the wife was considered a widow at that point in time, even though they never had come together and she would inherit all of her husband's belongings, okay? So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that a Jewish couple who had been betrothed were as good as married. The only thing that they were missing was um, final ceremony under a canopy and physical consummation. Okay, that was the only thing missing. Now, under Moses' law, the Old Testament, 
It demanded that the bride must be a virgin and that if a bride was not a virgin at her wedding, then she must be put to death. Okay? It seems a little unfair, doesn't it? Like it's only about the brides because they're the only ones who could give the proof. <laughs> but if every woman remained a virgin, then every man would be a virgin too, right? <laughs> so it kind of covered it in both ways like that, right? <laughs> By the time Jesus came to this earth, the death penalty for a woman who was not a virgin who had just been married, okay, the death penalty had given way to a milder penalty called divorce, okay? In other words, if your bride is not a virgin, then you must divorce. And that was a categorical imperative in Jewish law. And here is where the hair splitting has come in by the church. Matthew was writing in Greek, and he records Jesus' words, and the word that he recorded in Greek was fornication, not adultery. You go, well, what's the difference? Well, fornication is illicit sex before marriage. Adultery is illicit sex during, during marriage or inside marriage. So, the big exception clause, here's, here it is, because in Matthew we have an exception. Except for adultery, except for adultery, right? Because that's what we hear. We can divorce, unless it's adultery is in the marriage, then we can divorce. But it doesn't hold true, because here's what it is. The only exception Jesus allowed for divorce in Jewish law and culture was for fornication not for adultery. So what's fornication? Illicit sex before marriage. That's why in Matthew's gospel, it's recorded that Jesus's parents nearly divorced on that ground. Joseph thought that Mary had engaged in sex before marriage and being a just man, following Jewish law, he resolved to divorce her. But being a good man, he wanted to do it privately and not publicly to avoid her humiliation. Mm -hmm. That's an example of the exception clause which is spoken here by Jesus. He was referring exactly to that. So jo or, or Joseph, the husband of Mary, and he was her husband, even though they had not consummated, here Mary shows up pregnant. So obviously she must have had illicit sex before marriage, and Jesus says the only exception is divorce based on not adultery, but fornication. And most of the church has changed that word to adultery and not used the word fornication. Mm -hmm. Do you see the difference? Yeah, but how does that work with uh, this thing? If I'm assuming, probably. It's like black something. Uh, the Gentiles and right okay the, so we go back to okay yeah. good so that that's really good yeah mm -hmm. no so that means that for Gentiles there is no exception for anything that happens after marriage in our New Testament you can look up and um, mark and Luke on divorce and it's a categorical statement that there is no divorce period at all. God hates divorce. And we read a scripture last week. We started out when it said that God divorced Israel. We say, yeah, but you said God hates divorce. Well, really, remember, she had given him a divorce with all that she had been doing. But also, at the same time he gave her a divorce, he made a way of restoration because God is a God of <coughs> restoration. Just think about it. Adultery which is turning away from loyalty in a relationship. I am so glad that people who have turned away from God, who have divorced him, if you will, have wanted to come back to him. They've wanted restoration with him. And what happens? He gives it because he is a God of restoration. He never wanted them to leave in the first place. And that's why the word restoration should be on our lips and in our hearts rather than being so quick as the church has done and lowered its standards to say okay well there was adultery so that gives you the right to go ahead and divorce when i was a young child it was absolutely not i mean man i'll tell you you're put out of the church pretty much unless a woman had been divorced by her father my grandfather was a bad man 
and my grandfather was during World War II when my mother was a really little girl. He divorced my grandmother and the church took her in and took care of her along with my mother and my, my uncle um, because um, that man left her. But boy, it was a scandal and it was a real mark. And, and my mother and my, my uncle, you know, they felt it. They felt it big time. And so again, now I'm talking about the church, okay? I'm not talking about the world. Right. right. So, it, so, so what I understand about that,